As the EU and the rest of the world are forced to move much faster to fight climate change and pollution, I'm joined now by EU Commissioner for the Environment, Ocean and Fisheries, Virginius Sinkavicius. Commissioner, you're welcome to the Global Conversation on Euronews. Thank you for having me. Now, you have some very ambitious targets when it comes to ending soil pollution, sea pollution, air pollution, but how exactly are you going to implement any of these? First of all, probably the most effective way to address pollution is, of course, make it that it doesn't happen. Because then the situation gets very complicated. And this is where we are. We have premature deaths caused by pollution. We have diseases linked to a pollution. We have ecosystem destruction linked with the pollution. And it happens not somewhere else. It happens here in the EU. So we have to act quickly. I'm happy that the Commission just recently adopted a Zero Pollution Action Plan. By zero pollution, we mean, first of all, bringing down pollution levels so that they do not harm our citizens' health, that they do no harm to uh, ecosystems. The goal is, of course, ambitious. It will take time. Uh, we plan to do it by 2050. But, of course, there is lots of work to be done already by 2030. And, for example, uh, when we speak about the marine uh, pollution, uh, microplastics. Our plan mm -hmm. is to decrease the pollution from microplastics by 30%, looking into different types of measures. I think this pandemic is a good wake-up call to everyone and really a moment to think that we can do business differently. I mean, you mentioned now that the pandemic is an important opportunity because of, we know that there's been a reduction in carbon emissions uh, because of, you know, industrial output, less cars and so on. But how do we know that they, you know, as soon as this is pretty much over and we have everyone vaccinated, particularly in parts of Europe, that it's not just going to go straight back to normal. There's no real ambition there in terms of industry, at least. You're absolutely right. If we do nothing, the numbers will jump back and maybe even increase because we see that the tendency is actually mm. uh, increasing. So here is, as I said, you know, our horizontal uh, zero pollution action plan, which touches upon different areas. And I would say three major uh, areas which we are addressing is, of course, energy, uh, transport. We're looking at, of course, earlier on uh, our uh, proposed uh, chemicals. Uh, so this is the sectors where we especially put the focus on. And, for example, when we speak about transport, I think there is uh, a variety of tools. First of all, of course, working very closely with uh, municipalities and, and, and their governments. And, of course, their uh, investments into, into transportation system, making it more attractive to citizens, investing into micro-mobility solutions. And uh, Commission, of course, is, 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 is ready to help. But most importantly, of course, the unique opportunity comes with the public funding. And uh, especially speaking about our RRF, uh, Recovery Resilience Facility, where each member state will receive a, a, a solid uh, amount of cash to be invested, basically, into recovery and resilience building. Just before I move on to the recovery fund, because that's a really important, essential element here, just give us an example of, for example, you talked about chemicals uh, a moment ago. I mean, give us some examples of how industry will have to change or alter to ensure that there's less pollution? Um, will there be more legislation around um, harmful chemicals, pesticides? Will there be legislation around how, you know, cars are manufactured and so on? So first of all, if we speak about chemicals concretely, we're speaking, of course, about avoiding harmful chemicals, replacing them. And unless it's proved that in some products they cannot be replaced, uh, even so, then we, of course, encourage invest into research and development to uh, try to find the replacement. But our goal, of course, to replace or completely uh, exclude harmful chemicals uh, from our market, from the products. And we still have, I would say, very unequal uh, uh, legislation, where in some products it's very clearly banned already for a while, and in others they are not. And those products are easily accessible by children, uh, by women, by elderly people. So there is, of course, a, a, a groups which are more vulnerable, which we, of course, uh, need to protect as a priority. And uh, so there will be a major, of course, look uh, at our uh, chemicals legislation at REACH. Uh, but I think we're keeping a very close contact with the stakeholders. They also understand uh, that... Uh, the change 
uh, is inevitable, but also it brings a first mover's advantage and an opportunity. Uh, first of all, to be at most advanced with uh, research and development. Um, you know, there was a concern around Brexit and also the fact that the EU and the UK are sort of competing for trade deals now. There was a concern that there'll be a race to the bottom when it comes to st for standards, that the UK would reduce its standards in order to get, you know, more business in. Will the EU be a leader when it comes to ensuring that standards are actually maintained, despite the fact that it may mean, you know, less trade? I would say that there is a clear evidence that, that we maintain our leadership and even strengthen it. Uh, and we just discussed uh, chemicals. But there is uh, uh, plenty of other sectors which we are looking as well. Soon, uh, after, after summer break, uh, September, we're going to, to introduce one of the, the major initiatives of ours on deforestation, for example, where we want to look fully at the supply chains uh, that they wouldn't be uh, any uh, products associated with the deforestation. So I think this is a major breakthrough, again, raising a bar high uh, of, uh, of, of our standards. You mentioned the recovery fund, obviously a huge amount of money, unprecedented, and we know that the Green Deal obviously is sort of hand in hand with how this money is spent. But how, do we, how can we ensure that member states actually use the money to you know, fundamentally change their, you know, their position when it comes to sustainable farming or sustainable production and industry? And they're not just essentially greenwashing, which is something that the EU gets accused of quite frequently from environmental NGOs. Of course. First of all, uh, environmental NGOs and, 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 and more broadly NGOs are, are, are closely uh, watching the, the recovery and resilience uh, uh, plans, uh, which member states are, are, are still uh, submitting. But Commission also, of course, works very closely with member states. And our goal uh, is, is, of course, to make sure that, first of all, uh, our 37 percent goal for climate objective is upheld. And we have six uh, very concrete measures, which we, of course, will be looking uh, in the plan. Secondly, uh, member states, they also agreed on do no significant harm principle, which is going to be applied and looked in all of the projects uh, which are proposed uh, under the plans, making sure that, of course, we're not making a uh, step forward and then two steps mm -hmm. back, ensuring that those plans are coherent with our goals, uh, with our uh, uh, digital and uh, green uh, transition. Commissioner Sinkavishis, thank you very much for joining us on the Global Conversation on Euronews. Thank you.